Good morning. Thanks for joining the worship service here at Faith Fellowship Church in Athens, Texas. I'm Dr. Tony Romans, pastor. This morning we're going to be talking about the outcome of ingratitude. You know what I find in the Christian life, there's some things that God provides for us in redemption. That if those things are in place and we're operating in those things, they prevent other things from happening just by their very presence because you can't have both things. You can't be happy and sad at the same time. You can't be grateful and ungrateful at the same time. So today we're going to open our Bible to Romans chapter 1 and we're going to look at what the Apostle Paul describes people who walk away from God who eventually are turned over to, uh, by God to what the Bible calls a reprobate mind. But this morning in that list of things, one of the things that's mentioned is neither were they grateful. Today we're going to look at what, what was able to come into their life because gr gratitude was absent. And hopefully this morning you'll be encouraged to be grateful and not allow um, things that we don't want in our life there, but gratitude would safeguard us and keep us anchored to the cross and to the wall with Christ that God, that God desires for us to have. Again, we're glad you joined us. We want to invite you to come be with us in person. If you're ever in Athens, Texas on Sunday morning, our worship service begins at 1030. You'd be a welcome and wanted guest. Lord bless you. Church, take your Bible this morning and open it with me to the book of Romans, the first chapter. Have you ever wondered, God, is what I'm doing in this particular area what I should be doing? I think about worship. God, what we did today, is it, was it genuine worship? Was it biblically, would it meet the biblical definition of what worship is? My prayer life. God, am I praying the way you would have me pray? God, am I praying the way that, that Jesus died and opened the windows of heaven for me to pray and to to come into your presence. Now, that question comes to my mind this past week as Nancy and I were having our quiet time. Uh, I thought, God, am I grateful? Am I grateful? Now, let me tell you, uh, just a little aside, I don't believe there's such a thing as unconscious sin. Now, Pastor, why would you say that? Because the Holy Spirit was given to us to rebuke, exhort, and convict with all long suffering. So I believe that if anything that's going on, that sin, that the Spirit of God would convict me of that sin and show me that. And I trust the same Holy Spirit will teach us and guide us into the, the biblical expressions of those things that are our blessings and our privileges as a Christian. But I do believe Satan would love to deceive us, rob, steal, and kill uh, certain things and keep us at a place where maybe it's good, but it's not God's best. So this week or this month, as we think about gratitude and being grateful, I hope that's something that will be a part of your thoughts and a part of your mind. If you would, when you find Romans chapter 1, stand with me. We're going to begin reading in verse 18. When we get down to verse 21, we're going to read it off the monitor together, and then I'm going to read a few more verses as well. But uh, as the Apostle Paul writes this uh, theological uh, book to the church at Rome, one of the what's called the diamond or the, the jewel of all Paul's writings theologically, in chapter 1, we begin to find out why, how do wicked and unrighteous people get that way? How did it happen? He says in verse uh, 17 that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. But look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Read verse 21 with me, would you? Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now take up again in verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And change the glory of incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Father, you are the incorruptible God. You do not change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Father, we've come this morning and we pray that our hearts and minds would be open to receive your word, that your Holy Spirit would be able to teach us, show us, lead us, guide us, encourage us, convict us if it needs to be, encourage us and strengthen us and build us up on your faith. And Father, to that end, we pray that you'd be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and be seated if you would. 
as I said in this introductory chapter, Paul starts here in uh, the first chapter talking about the wicked and the unrighteous and how they get that way. But even in that, that because of creation, because all that God has done, no man, no woman is without excuse for not living up to the light that they have. In the midst of this discussion, Paul says in just this short phrase, neither were they thankful. Well, I, I want to submit to you this morning, I believe that's the point. There's the things in the Christian life that when the things that God was have us have in place are there, there's certain things that they keep at bay. You can't, for instance, you can't have joy and, happy, and, and, and sadness at the same time. You can move quickly between the two, but you can't have them both at the same time. I don't believe you can have love and grace active in your life and be unforgiving. You have to stop being loving and you have to stop being graceful to, to be unforgiving. There are certain things, and this morning I want us to think about when gratitude is not in its rightful place, what can be the outcomes, and we're going to catalog those in these verses that we've read, of what took place, of what can take place when gratitude is not there to keep us anchored to the place that God would have us be as a redeemed people. That's been said, I, I, one of the old sages said that ingratitude is the greatest of all sins. And it said, because if you lay any other, any other vice down besides ingratitude, ingratitude so bad it makes that look like a virtue. <laughs> I don't know that we get that. I don't know that we really think of ingratitude as a big deal. I don't know that we really live a day thinking and, and, and taking our thoughts captive to ungrateful and unkind things. Uh, and, and it's an easy thing to do. Satan, come in. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus said. And one of the things I believe he wants to do that too is our gratitude. Well, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says when, gra when gratitude is not there, here's where they can go and here's where it can lead to. And it, it's sort of a, it gets worse as it goes kind of list. But if you want to fill in the outline, let's get Roman number one. I want to talk about indifference. When gratitude is not there towards God, there can be an indifference towards God. Now, think about it. Indifferent. I, I'm, not, I'm not opposing God. I'm just not with him. I'm just not uh, praising him and thanking, thanking him for who he is and all he's done. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. If you're not gathering in, you're scattering abroad. Jesus said there's not some spiritual coasting that I can be unengaged and it be okay. And I believe when gratitude is not there, the, one of the first things that happen, I can become, begin to be indifferent towards God. These people have begun to be indifferent. Look at the first part of verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. They, they knew He was God. They wouldn't say there's not a God. No, nobody says there's not a God at first. If you find somebody today that tells you I'm at the place in my life where I don't believe there's a God, I promise you something has happened. Back in their past, some traumatic thing happened. Some very hurtful thing happened. Satan interpreted their pain, and they put a pressure on their thinking to say there is no God. But if you would remove that pressure, they would once again say what they said as children, I know there's a God. I know there's a God. I know there's a God. But it's not that they didn't know there was a God. They were just indifferent towards God. They didn't want anything to do with God. Notice it says when they knew. How did we know that? Look at verse 19 and 20. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them and God has shown it to them. Every man, look, you can't look at creation and design and not know that there's a God. Now again, a man can begin to put intellectual pressure on himself and uh, say, no, no, I've decided, I have decided there is no God. And we're going to see that's what they did. It was a decision they came to, and it's a decision that men and women can come to today. But when gratitude is in its place, it keeps us engaged into who God is and all that God is doing. And indifference towards God is... Um, not something that can happen when gratitude is in the right place. The problem was they did not glorify Him as God. They didn't give God that rightful place in their life, which is a place of gratitude. I still remember I was doing a series on joy two or three years ago, and I was searching through the Bible about joy and, and just looking in its context, what passage talked about joy in its context, and not just a, in its context, not just a, a passing reference. But I, I was taken aback. When God says to the Old Testament uh, saints, one of the reasons they were being sent into exile in Babylon was, you did not serve me with joy. Didn't say you didn't serve me. 
They brought sacrifices. They went through the rope. They went through the routine. They went through the motions. Many of them did. Some didn't even do that. But even the ones that were doing that, there was no joy in it. It was a burden. It was a tax. It was a task. And God said, because you've not served me with joy. I think about God, if you felt that way about joy, what must you feel about gratitude? That your children ought to wake up every day and, and with the very first thoughts of our morning ought to be a gratitude to God for His goodness. <laughs> As Jordan's saying, all my life He's been faithful. Amen. I had some little voices sitting around me, six and seven years old, singing all their life. He has been go so good. And I'm 62. And I can tell you, all my life He's been faithful. Amen. All my life He's been faithful. See, gratitude keeps us engaged in a relationship to God that's appropriate. It's appropriate. So many things you can't do without gratitude. We talked about worship at the beginning of the service. I think bear fruit and be fruitful. The Spirit of God bearing spiritual fruit in our life uh, can't can be done without gratitude. But not only indifference. Number two, let's talk about ignorance. Look at the second part of uh, verse 21. It says, um, but became futile in their thoughts and foolish hearts were darkened. He uses two words to describe when ingratitude wasn't there and indifference was taking its place. He uses the word futile and foolish. Futile thoughts and a foolish heart that wound up in darkness. Futile thoughts, that's just, it's talking about, when you see the word futile, it's talking about empty or worthless thoughts. How much of our thought life is taken up with, with simply futile and worthless things? That gratitude to God would have God fixed and centered in our thought life and in a way that would cause us to, to see His goodness, to, to, to look around. My, my dad, while um, there were a lot of ways he wasn't a, a spiritual giant, at Christmas... At Christmas, all the Romans clan came to my house. My daddy was one of the few Romans that worked. And so all the family would come, and mom and dad would put out a, this big spread, and dad would say something, not just what he said, it's how he said it. He would wave his hand over the table, and the table and the counter that was just filled up with food of all kind and pies and cakes, and he'd look around and he said, man, 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 look at all this. Look at all this. Every now and then, I just, it catches my mind, it catches my thoughts, and I think, and I say, my, 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 look at all this. Look at what God has done for me. Look, look at all, look at all that God has done. Now, I know Satan wants to think, look at the things we don't have. We're, we may talk before it's over about things that steal gratitude and things that rob us, uh, rob it from our hearts. But this morning, when Gratitude wasn't there. Their thoughts became futile and it led to a darkening of their heart, a darkness in their heart that uh, they didn't live in the light of the goodness of God. They didn't live in the light of, of redemption. They didn't live in the light of, of all that God had for them. But because they were rejecting God, because there was indifference, they weren't grateful, it was easy for them to move from indifference to ignorance, to ignorance. The result was that the ability to reason in a godly way was lost and gone. And they were darkened. Jesus said when it came to darkness, this is the condemnation that light has come to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Men choose darkness because they love darkness. They love their evil. They love their sin. They don't want to give up their sin to walk in the light of who God is and what God wants for their lives. There's an indifference that leads to an ignorance. And in verse 22, he moves to something that I just simply call the intellectualism. It's, it's an appalling thing. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. But look at verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Now that word professing, it was a self-proclamation. I have decided that I'm going to remove God from my thinking. I've decided that I'm going to be indifferent and be uh, ignorant to the things of God. But I want you to know I, pr I pronounce myself wise. And it's one of the things of the elite world, is it not? You know, uh, years and years ago, decades ago now, uh, one of the elites said, well, you know, Christianity is a crutch. It's for weak-minded people. 
and the, the, the sinful and the wicked have elevated their thinking and they have made themselves, why, professing themselves wise. You see, I, I'm too enlightened for that kind of stuff. That superstition, they would call it. That, uh, that ignorance, they would call it. Apostle Paul said, that follows. Where there's no gratitude, there's indifference. Where there's indifference, there's ignorance. And ultimately there comes an intellectualism that says, I'm smarter, I'm better, I'm better off, I'm more intelligent than you because I'm enlightened. A year, several years ago now, it's been a couple decades as well, uh, some of the homosexual community began to proclaim that they were enlightened because uh, evolution had, had brought them beyond the normal and they were the more enlightened of, the, of, the, of this community. Sin leads to an intellectualism, an enlightenment that uh, is nothing more than an arrogance. Think about it. The arrogance to dismiss God's revealed truth and then pronounce, your, pronounce yourself wise for it. It says, professing themselves wise, they became fools. Now the word fool is not mentally deficient, not that they didn't have the capacities to reason. But their capacities have been so impacted by the darkness they chose, they became foolish. The word fool there in the Greek has the moreno as its root, and we get our word moron, English word moron from it. Not to believe in God is moronic. When you know God, it's been said that, you know, that faith in God is a leap in the dark. That's not true. It couldn't be anything farther than the truth. God has revealed who He What's the word revealed? It means He turned the light on. God revealed, here's who I am. Here's what I've done. When it comes to our sin, God reveals our sin. And He through the cross reveals His grace and His redemption. He says, now, this is how much I love you. I love you so much. I sent my son to die on the cross for your sin. Now come leap into the arms of God who loves you and whose grace makes it possible for you to be redeemed from your sin. Does that sound stupid to you? There's not a greater wisdom on the planet than to hear and see what God has revealed and made known. But what they did, God revealed it, but that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. Two times in the Bible it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We live in a foolish day, a foolish time where men have removed God from their thinking and they've done so at their own peril but in the process, they profess themselves to be wise and to be advanced and to be above all of those who seek after God's truth. But I want to tell you something. They didn't get there without having to do some things that gratitude would have prevented them from ever doing. Had gratitude been in the heart, indifference couldn't have followed, not with gratitude. Certainly, uh, walking in the ignorance of sin and, and in the intellectualism of professing themselves wise, none of that could have followed had gratitude been in its rightful place. Look at verse 23. When you have those first three things, or those first two things, the next thing is going to be, the fourth thing is going to be idolatry. Idolatry. Notice, and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Now, I, I want you to get, there, this, there's an amazing truth here that I hope you don't miss. Did you notice, although they rejected God, they were still religious. They were still religious. Instead of God being the God who reveals, no, 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 that's not the God we want. We're going we're gonna to exchange Him. We're going to get to it a little more in just a moment. But we're going to exchange Him. and We're going we're gonna to raise up a God. Every man worships something or somebody. Every person worships. Worship is in the part of how God created us, and He created us to know and worship Him. But without, without a relationship with God, without a gratitude towards God to worship Him like we should, then there's always our gratitude is going to downgrade to something else or somebody else. Notice it says they, they created gods that looked like man, that looked like uh, the created beings. They created them, they fashioned them with their hands, and then in their wisdom and in their intellectual prowess, they knelt down to a stump and called it God and prayed to it. Or they fashioned a man and named him a God and bowed down and reverenced him. You see... Man can get away from God, but he can't get away from the religious nature that God created every man and woman with. Isn't that an amazing thing? 
They, now, I don't want anything to do with God. You see, it's, it's, when you find people who don't know Christ, they, they would absolutely walk away from and detest Christian truth. The, the biblical truth of the Word of God, they reject it. But I promise you, that doesn't mean they're not religious. They worship something. And there's times people keep coming to church because they, their religious needs an expression. So what you may be going to church was that. And so they, they come to church, but not to hear what God's truth is revealed, not to receive revealed truth, but because it's just a religious practice. And I'm going to, exp I'm going to express my religious religiosity somehow. So they come, and even though truth is here, and even though the Word of God is proclaimed, uh, we're going to see in a moment, they already have a response for that. They already have a, a pattern with that that's not going to allow the truth of God to get through. But they're religious people. I, I don't know why that just really amazed me as I, I thought about they rejected the true God, but did not cease to be religious in the process. Notice it said, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man. The word incorruptible simply means unchanging and not capable of corruption. James speaks of God and he says, in him is no darkness, not even a shadow of turning. You ever understood that phrase, shadow of turning? If you were up here where you could see my shadow, every time I move, there is a a change in my shadow. What James is saying is you can let the bright noonday sun shine on God all day long. His shadow never moves. His character never changes. He's not corruptible. You can't downgrade God to a God that you like. See, you know, God's not doing things in my life the way I think he should. So I'm just going to create a God that's the way I want him. I'm going to create a God that's the way I want it. Dismissed the truth of God, but didn't cease to be religious. Gratitude, gratitude keeps those things at bay because gratitude for God, for who He is and for what He's done and for what He's doing in our life keeps us from idolatry. God, I love you. I'm grateful to you for who you are. I don't want to try to change you. Over the years, I, you've heard me say it here in the past 10 years, uh, there's been times in having conversations with people that say, what does the Bible say? Well, that's... What I believe God's called me to do is to teach the Word of God. That's what I went to, to college to prepare for, to be able to look at the Word of God and to teach it and to say in this context, here's what God is saying. And I feel very comfortable in those kind of conversations. But every once in a while, somebody say, well, why do you think God said that? And I'm through. <laughs> Above my pay grade. I don't know why God said it. I don't need to know why God said it because I believe He's a good, good Father. And everything that he does is for my blessing and for my benefit. Even if I don't see it at the moment, if I don't see it at that perfect time. The thought came to me one time I was talking about the will of God and somebody was straying. Well, as I look at this, I don't see how this wouldn't be in the will of God for God to do this thing that I'm asking God to do, but God's not done it yet. I don't see how that couldn't be in the will of God. <laughs> the problem is you and I don't see everything that God sees. If we saw everything that God sees, we would understand that what He's doing is perfect because it is. That's who He is and that's all He can do. But they created gods that look like them. Now let's look at verse 25. The, the last thing I want to talk about is the insult. Where does it run to? It goes from indifference to ignorance to intellectualism. Then it gets to idolatry and finally the full insult to God is seen when these people are lived without, live without gratitude to God and they're allowed for their flesh just to go. And look at verse 25. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. Now I want you to notice there's two statements about truth in our text that we read today that I want you to understand. If you understand this, you can see how somebody can be so, so lost and so dark and so wicked. Look back, start in verse 18. Look at the last few verses. Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What's the first thing Paul says? The truth is there, but they suppress it. What does that mean? They push it down in their mind. They push it down in their thinking. I don't, I'm not going to operate in that truth. It, it's there. God, is, God has shown me who he is. He's shown me through his creation that he's eternal God and he's awesome in his power. But I want to suppress that. The only way they can move on in their darkness is to suppress truth and say, no, that's not the truth I want to walk in. I want to, I want to suppress that. But then what happens later, look at verse 25, the first phrase, who exchanged truth. 
You see, after suppressing truth for a while, they got to the place where they said, okay, I've got truth in this hand, but I'm going to exchange it, and I'm going to take the lie with this hand. I'm going to turn loose of truth that God has revealed, and I'm going to receive the lie, and I'm going to hold on to it, and I'm going to make the lie the things that I operate under. You see, every man to get to the place where he says there's no God, he has to exchange truth for the lie. You see, that's where Satan is driving with hardships and difficult times and being twice-born people in a once-born world. We live in a world that's here, the heartaches and sorrow here because by one man came sin and by sin came death. And Satan, who tempted the first sin to happen, then turns around and blames the consequence on sin and tries to lay it at God's feet and have people doubt that God is, in fact, a good, good father. They exchange, they suppress the truth to start with. The only way they can begin to move down that road is to suppress it. I'm going to suppress that. But there comes a point in time where their heart is so darkened, they willfully exchange truth for a lie. Gratitude, gratitude for who God is and gratitude for the truth that God has revealed will cause us not to even suppress it, but to invite it into our life. To, to see it as uh, the book of Proverbs calls wisdom uh, like a woman, personifies it like a woman who calls in the street saying, to her, come love me, come love wisdom, come love uh, God's truth. God has revealed it. He's not playing hide and go seek with his truth. He gives, he's given us his truth. He's laid it out for us. But in order for men to live ungodly lives, they have to first begin to suppress. But that won't do for long enough to get where their sin is ultimately trying to take them. They have to exchange truth for the lie. And they were living in such a way that that enabled it to happen. Notice they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Can you think of a greater insult to God? Now, we talked a moment ago about they created gods that looked like man and beast. That, that's, a, that's a funny thing, isn't it? Men start choosing to want to live in sin. They start suppressing truth. They start exchanging it. They, 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 want, to, they want to deny God, but, but they're religious. They're religious. They can't help being religious. God created us that way. Every man is uh, worships something or someone. So they start fashioning a God that, that is acceptable to them. The, the, the true God of heaven, I, I'm, I'm not really thrilled with that one. So I'm going to start creating my own, and they, they fashion their own God, and they step aside and say, okay, now there, that's a God that, that fits me. He likes what I like. He don't like what I don't like, and so that's my God. The only problem is when you get up to his face, he looks incredibly like you. We create gods in our own image. We fashion God to my taste and to my liking. When God said of truth, Jeremiah said truth is like a plumb line that God drops down in the middle of his people and if you want to see how your is your life leaning away from God look at the plumb line of truth and am I buttressed up against truth the church is to be the pillar and ground of truth Amen. Jesus said father sanctify them through truth thy word is truth Amen. see it's easy men begin to do things like well I don't know the Bible says that but they're suppressing truth I know the Bible says that, but I, I just believe. And they've, they've elevated intellectualism of their own thinking because they suppress the truth of God and maybe almost at the place where they're ready to exchange it for the lie. But I want to submit to you today, I believe with all my heart, that if gratitude were in place, especially in the heart of a believer, gratitude is in place, those things that are insults to God would never enter our life because gratitude and indifference can't coexist. Gratitude and ignorance of, of God and His ways can't coexist. Gratitude and elevating my own thinking into intellectualism that I'm, I'm somehow better than God. <laughs> That's why it calls Paul to say God to chose the foolish things to confound the wise. These guys on the Areopagus on Mars Hill who, who fancy themselves the, the, the Harvards and the Yales, the, the uh, great scholars of their day, they had dismissed God and had replaced God with their own thoughts and their own philosophies, their own thinking. <laughs> God said, I'm going to take the foolish things. Or not, not that they're foolish, but the world calls them foolish. And I'm going to confound the wise. The wisdom of man is confounded at the foolishness of the wisdom of God. He says, they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. 
Did you see? As Paul spoke, he encouraged his own heart. They worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Amen. Paul says, I'm just going to amen myself right there. Amen. He's a God who's worthy of worship. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy of our lives. Psalm 138.2 said, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. Why? For you have, you have magnified your word above your name. Old King James says you've elevated. You've magnified your word above your name. God said, listen, I want you to know when somebody starts trying to downgrade truth to fit their own sinful choices and to fit their sinful lifestyles, they're trying to bring down truth off the pedestal God has put it on. And God said, I won't allow that. I won't allow that. I've elevated my word. I've magnified it up above my name. See, to get there, there's some trade-offs that have to happen. And in the midst of all that, it, it, just that little phrase, there it is in our, in, in our, in our, in our text that we read. Uh, Nor were they thankful, in verse 20. They, they just weren't thankful. As I, as I think about it, what, what was the outcome of it? Well, there's three statements, verse uh, uh, 24, 26, and 28. Look at verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness, the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Look, if you're going to suppress truth and live a lie and, and, and displace man your thoughts, he said God gave them up. So I'm, I'm, going to let you, I'm going to let you have what you've asked for. Then again in verse 24, God gave them up. Therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness and lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. I said, okay, I'm going to give you up. Look down to verse 28. And even though they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Oh, King James calls it reprobate mind, a debased mind. A mind, God said, okay, I'm going to give you up. But after a while, God said, I'm going to give you over. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you go. That, that's the way you're pressing. That's the way you're choosing. You're rejecting my truth. You're, you're, you're not grateful for me. You're not grateful for, for the life I've given you. You're not grateful for anything about it. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn you over. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you up and I'm going to turn you over to a reprobate mind. I believe if we ask the question, why is it common for Christians to live their lives without gratitude. I believe we would quickly agree that one of the greatest reasons, first reason probably, is spiritual warfare. If Satan can rob and steal my gratitude to God, what does is, what is a, what is a grateful life look like? What does a man who loves his wife, who's grateful for his wife, what does their relationship look like? A woman who's grateful for her husband, what, is that, what does that life look like? For, for a friend that's grateful for a friend, what, is, what does a life between them look like? When a person is grateful to God for their church family, what, what does that look like? What do our lives look like? I believe the very first thing that happens when we're not focused and living in gratitude and we just begin to get indifferent. That's where it begins. We're not against God. We're just indifferent. We're just begin, we just begin to, to try to coast or to try to drift. And remember... There is not a current that causes you to drift towards God. The world, the flesh, and the devil make sure that all currents drift you away from truth and away from God. As I thought about it this week, I, I had to ask myself, Lord, let me, let me look at Tony. How far in my life does indifference make its way? Has it, made it, has it got a foothold in my heart? Has it got a foothold in my life? God, how about ignorance? Am I wanting to suppress truth? Am I wanting to, to change what you've said and how, what you've revealed about yourself and about your nature? God, am I trying to, I, have I decided I want to suppress or I want to exchange that for something that's more palatable to me? In the process, am I excusing myself and am I elevating myself and saying, well, I, it's okay, I, 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 that's all right, uh, I, I'm all right. <laughs> Notice um, one of the last statements about those who live this way. Look at verse 32. 
who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving death, not only do the same, but they also approve of those who practice them. Those saying is misery loves company, sin does too, and sin leads to misery. If I can, get, if I can just find me a group of people who agree like I do, we can, we can all affirm one another. That's why you can find every kind of godless church imaginable called a church. They've taken a particular sin that they've decided is not sin and they've pronounced over it uh, a wisdom and a righteousness that it's okay and let's all come together and we'll all have that sin and we'll practice it but we'll all tell each other we're okay that God loves us and that's true. Every lie is built around a kernel of truth. It's not about God's love. It's about what God's revelation and what truth is and what God deserves back to, uh, to Him from us because of who He is and what He's done. God, how far down my life has ingratitude pulled me? Where is it taking me? I promise you, if we can't find in all of the goodness of God that which would lance us to the cross and to gratitude, wherever it takes, wherever we go, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. But where gratitude exists... Indifference can't make it. Ignorance can't make it. Intellectual is not going to be there. Certainly not idolatry and certainly not insult to God. Not when there's gratitude in the place it should be. I've told you this story. I think about it often. My, my, my mom and my daddy both were uh, one of seven and nine children. My mom's daddy was a peanut farmer in Mississippi and uh, didn't, didn't have a lot. I mean, he had 10 whole acres to do it on. <laughs> My daddy was one of seven, and they, they, he went to the third grade, lived in poverty. But there was something in Mama that I, I never forget. I, I was riding in the car with Mama one day, and um, I don't even remember the conversation, but I remember well what happened. I said something, somebody had done something for me, and I said something, sliding it or Obviously, I wasn't grateful for it. And as my mom and daddy were apt to do, mama took her hand and she slapped me on the mouth because that's where the problem was. And she said, boy, nobody owes you anything. The very least you can be in this life is grateful. And mama just knocked it in my head that the greatest sin I can imagine is ingratitude. All of us has felt the sting of ingratitude from somebody. We, we were just wanting to be kind. We wanted to be gracious. We wanted to be helpful. And what we got back was we didn't do enough. We didn't do what we should. We didn't do all we could. And as though we had to do we should have done, we were compelled to do something to begin with. But for the life of me, I cannot begin to imagine what it must be to the heart of God. Not... I'm going to set aside the reprobate minds. Let, let's, let's leave the lost world out of the discussion from this point on. Let's talk about blood-bought children of God who've repented of their sin through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They've received the Son of God as Savior and Lord of life. The Spirit of God has come in and brought them from spiritual death to spiritual life. And they are alive in Christ Jesus, born again by the grace and goodness of God with the promise of God's grace, God's presence, and God's eternity before us. And God looks down into the hearts of us and says, where did gratitude go? What, what, what happened? What, is God more, what more has God got to do for you to be grateful? What more has God got to do for me? For me to understand that ingratitude is not okay in my heart for one minute much less days and weeks of my life. That God deserves, if nothing else, besides of unbounding love and gratitude, God deserves every moment of my life be lived grateful to God for who He is and what He's done. But I believe spiritual warfare says, Satan says, if I can get them to be ungrateful, if I can get them for a while to, to stop thinking about the goodness and the grace of God, if I can, they can begin, just begin to get them to be indifferent about my grace and my goodness. If I just get them to be that, then I can begin to lead them down a darkness in their heart, a darkness in their soul. He can't, he can't get us to be lost. We're God's children bought by the blood of God, by the, by the blood of Christ. Nothing can take our, our relationship to God away 
in our salvation, but he can begin to downgrade our relationship on a practical basis with God. The outcome of ingratitude is bad. Pick any one of those things you want to pick and none of them are good. What does God deserve from your heart and mind this morning? Are we grateful? We got, we've got a month here that we're going to be talking about and thinking about gratitude. And I hope it, it gets in our heart in such a way that lasts all year long. All year long. List of all those things. Giving themselves over debase themselves in all kind of sensuous living, all kind of perversions, all kind of recklessness. And in the midst of all that list of sin, neither were they thankful. I believe gratitude, when it's there, keeps at bay many, many of the attacks of the enemy because gratitude says, no, God deserves better than that. I'm not going to allow that. No, no way. That's not it. Maybe here today and you've never accepted Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. I don't know why. I have no idea why. Maybe you, you've just felt like you were so bad, God couldn't love you. God did love you. The Bible says that God commended his love to us while we were yet sinners, Christ died. On your worst day ever, if you could go back in your past and you could pick the day that you think was the blackest, worst day of your life, that was the day Christ died for you on. Because God loves you, not because you're deserving of his love, but because he loves you, and by grace he wants you to know his love and forgiveness and redemption. You see, to reject Christ is to forever say to Christ on Calvary, I'm not grateful for what you did. I'm not grateful for what you tried to accomplish. I don't want it. I'm not going to receive it. I'm going to reject it and leave it out of my life. But to look at Christ on the cross and know what he did, to be grateful would say, Lord God, I want to repent of my sin and I want to trust Christ to be Savior and Lord of my life. This morning, how will we express our gratitude to God? Maybe for some it might be that very response to Calvary to be saved. But how about for the rest of us? If you would write on a sheet of paper what a grateful to God life looks like, would your life mirror the description? Would our life say, here's what a grateful life looks like. Here's, here's what it's about. Here's what it's like. Are we teaching our children, our grandchildren, the importance of gratitude? The power, the power of gratitude. And what it does in our lives. But no more anywhere than when our gratitude is towards God. Maybe today I'm talking to a Christian and all you've been is negative. All you've looked at is what you don't have. All you've looked at is what didn't turn out the way you thought it should. And it's been a long time. Listen to me. Be honest. It's been a long time since we were truly, genuinely grateful. We've bowed our head at prayer and said, Lord, thank you for this food. But in truth, we weren't even thankful for that. There's been a time or two when I've sat down to broccoli and I've said to somebody, you're going to have to pray. It's hard for me to be thankful for that. <laughs> it's not my favorite. See, we, were, we, we kind of throw around the word thank you, thank you, thank you, but seldom do we mean it. And I believe that sets us up for the enemy to make headways into our life because we're, if gratitude were there, it would be the sentry that guards the, heart of our, the door of our heart and says, no, uh-uh, indifference, uh, in ignorance, idolatry, insult, that's not coming in here because I'm grateful to God. I'm grateful to God. Can we pray about it for a moment? Now, Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, Lord, we would quickly and gladly confess there is so much to be grateful for. And yet, Father, we have to allow you to honestly examine our hearts. Allow your Holy Spirit to search one of our inner thoughts in life and answer only for ourselves the question, am I truly, genuinely grateful Or do I say the word and not mean it and I just patronize gratitude? I don't really participate. Father, I pray for my heart. I ask you to forgive me of the sin of ingratitude. And I pray, Father, that you would allow me to fix my mind on you in such a way that gratitude is an immovable part 
of my thoughts, of my process, of my living, of my loving, of my worship. That truly gratitude has found its mark in my heart. And I'm marked by it. Father, I pray for that heart that's never accepted your Savior and Lord of their life. They fill their minds with all kinds of other thoughts. They've suppressed truth. Maybe they've even exchanged truth. But this morning, the Spirit of God has brought them back to the reality that there is a God and He's awesome in His power and He's eternal. And they need to receive your Son, Jesus, as the only payment for their sin to be born again by your Spirit from death to life. Father, I pray for all of us who can testify to that redeeming grace that all of us will allow you to examine our hearts to the question, am I grateful? Am I truly grateful? So Father, today we ask you to do your sweet work in our lives. Draw us to yourself and as you do, Father, may we respond for your glory, for your honor, and for our blessing. In Jesus' name.